and uh, well, welcome back everyone. It's, uh, it's good to see the backs of so many heads um, in the room and the faces on the screen. It's uh, quite, a, quite an interesting experience. Um, we are going to look this morning now at uh, patient reported outcomes. It's been something of an ugly duckling, I think, in the uh, world of cancer research now for uh, a wee while. Um, uh, uh, poorly regarded by many, uh, badly treated, badly used by many, but increasingly the swan is beginning to appear. And uh, uh, taking the Hans Christian Andersen uh, analogy to its uh, conclusion, uh, I would like to think that the swan is very shortly going to be welcomed into the, uh, the community, the flock, as, as an equal uh, with all the benefit that that implies for delivering uh, good quality information, good quality uh, outcomes uh, for patients, for new treatments, uh, and for um, ultimately uh, the overall benefit of, of our patients. What we're going to do is we're going to look at the uh, a bit of a bit of background and positioning of PROs um, with the Alec Busi, who is uh, uh, works with the Centre for Patient Reported Outcomes in in Birmingham and has some very interesting sarcoma connections as well. Uh, we're going to look at the uh, use of the uh, EORTC item library uh, with Dagmar Agulis and. Then with the way that uh, PROMs are being developed in the world of sarcoma, uh, with the person leading that work, Dr. Olga Hussen uh, from Amsterdam. And finally, the issue of survivorship and how patient reported outcomes uh, in particular uh, are really valuable in looking at the research issues that there are in survivorship. And what those research issues are uh, is quite interesting because that itself has been the subject of research, as you'd expect. So uh, Richard Stevens, is, who was very uh, pivotal in that work in the UK, uh, is going to talk about that. So our first speaker is Dr. Lee Alyukbusi. Lee is a research fellow at uh, in Birmingham University, and I've worked with him on a, uh, a number of papers, mostly remotely, uh, and. Um, uh, the, the, the Centre for Patient Reported Outcomes Research is uh, becoming very pivotal uh, in the way that uh, PROMS, PROs are developing in the whole world of medical research. But Lee has a particular interest in sarcoma because he now has a PhD student and together they've been awarded a grant by Sarcoma UK uh, to develop her PhD uh, because she is a surgeon interested in using uh, the non-medical, the, uh, the PROs, if you like, uh, as a research tool to support her work as a surgeon. So, um, Lee, over to you. Uh, if you want to say a little bit more about yourself and uh, the, pro the project you're running, that's fine, but uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, thanks for the introduction. I think I would, I would say more as I go along. Um, just to say that um, the PhD project that um, uh, Roger just said is on the way and hopefully we'll be able to share some of the findings in subsequent um, conferences. So I, I hope you can see my screen and I'm just going to go to full screen now. Okay, thank you. Lovely. That's up. So um, when I was asked to present um, at this conference, there were many ways I could have taken this particular topic, but I decided to focus more on um, the role of PROs as it's changing over time in cancer research. And I hope you find a few things of interest in this presentation. I'll start off by um, you know, showing my uh, funding disclosures um, and I'll leave that just for a a brief period. So as an intro, um, I'd like to define PROs because often people use the acronym without probably understanding fully 
uh, what it actually stands for. And I've actually come across a few misconceptions uh, as a result. Uh, so PRO is actually a patient reported outcomes. And a PRO is any report of the status of a patient's health condition that comes directly from the patient without interpretation by anyone else, clinician or family members. And that's the definition from the FDA. So why are PROs important? PROs are important because they provide the patient voice. Um, often, like Roger just mentioned, you know, when you have a trial or any research, the clinical outcomes are the key outcomes that people focus on. But PROs give the opportunity to provide the patient perspective on whatever um, is being explored. It gives us, it provides a systematic way of measuring the patient's views of how the disease and the treatment impacts on their health and well-being. And how are PROs captured? So PROs are captured using um, self-reported questionnaires, which we call PROMs. So the PRO is the outcome, the PROM is the measure. And so therefore PROMs measure the patient's health status. I'd like to distinguish um, PROMs from PREMs because again, these two are often uh, mi you know, uh, misunderstood. PREMs are patient reported experience measures. And these are measures that focus on the process of care rather than the outcomes of care. But both of them are patient reported. So um, in the Traditionally, pro PROs were often collected with PROMs that involved pen and paper. And this has been how it's been collected for you know, decades. This has this limited the, um, the use of PROs significantly because it meant that you know, the paper versions had to be converted to electronic. And sometimes because of one thing or the other, the PRO uh, data is not even analyzed as part of clinical research. So for a long time, this has been a limiting factor uh, in the usefulness of PROs. But recently, due to the advances in technology um, and of course, uh, adoption of electronic devices by, you know, the, by people, this upsurge meant that we could now create electronic versions of PROs. And the obvious advantages were that it removed uh, the need for manual entry of data. And so human error was caught to almost non-existence. And also the administrative burden, which used to be in the past, uh, has been significantly reduced. What that means is that um, PROs can now be analyzed faster and the data more reliable and hopefully published as part of uh, a trial. Um, the use of electronic PROs also meant that um, rather than have patients complete entire long um, questionnaires of you know, anything from 10 to 50 questions, now it can be personalized to individual patients. And this has presented once again, um, a lot of opportunities in terms of research and even in clinical care. And also um, the data can be acted upon in real time because again, it's removed the processes um, of uh, manual entry. So those are the new things that have come up as a result of electronic, um, the use of electronic PROs. In addition, um, prior to, um, so in the past, because there hasn't been guidance on how to include PROs in trials, the inclusion had, had been suboptimal. So people have just included anyhow, because there wasn't any clear guidance. But in 2018, um, Calvert and colleagues um, who I actually work with, um, developed a guidance for the inclusion of PROs in clinical trials. And this has really improved the quality of um, PROs uh, in clinical trials, and in turn, the quality of the data 
um, that has been obtained. So we see an increase as more and more people um, adopt these guidelines. And since this 2018 um, guideline, we've also pr produced more guidance around the, not just the inclusion of PROs in um, clinical trials, but also the reporting, because it's, it's not enough to, to do a good job. You've got to report it properly. And one thing that was found again was that the reporting was not optimal. So in terms of guidance, more guidance is now available uh, to guide uh, the use of PROs in clinical trials in oncology research. And of course, we have to say that, you know, um, PROs provide the efficacy um, of interventions from a patient perspective. So I'd like to um, highlight um, one of the ways, because like Roger said, you know, PROs has always been seen as the ugly duckling, and often people ignore PRO results. But actually, this is starting to change. We are seeing a change in the way people regard PRO data. And one of the key ways we can see this change is the way it's informed and is continuing to inform regulatory decisions. I wouldn't say it informs every regulatory decision, but more and more we're starting to see uh, PRO data actually informing these decisions. And I'd like to give the example of um, the study uh, of Mixozantron, which was looking at uh, prostatic cancer. And it was looking at the use of prednisone um, in this population. Now, it was clear from the start that there was not going to be any change in overall survival, which is often the key um, endpoint in, you know, in clinical oncology research. So for this particular study, uh, the primary outcome was the palliation of pain. And nobody can actually assess pain better than the patient. So um, it, it stands to reason that, you know, for this trial, uh, the PROs were the primary endpoints. Um, and so patient completed the mcgill uh, Meldak pain questionnaire. And it's, the results of this trial was based on that questionnaire. And it was found that, you know, people who received uh, Mixantone, um, they did experience significant improvement in their PROs. Um, when combined with prednisone. The outcome of this study was that based on this PRO endpoints and the improvements on these endpoints, uh, there was regulatory approval of the drug uh, and also wider implementation in clinic. So here is an example of how PROs have, have actually uh, informed regulatory decision. And I'll give another example. This is uh, the Comfort um, Eye trial, which is a phase three trial. Um, here, the PRO was seen as an exploratory endpoint. And often, to be honest, PROs, if they're included, are often secondary um, or exploratory, mostly exploratory. But again, the tide's changing. And like the previous example, you could have PROs as primary endpoints. So for this example, Ruxolitinib was the drug, and uh, the effect that was being explored was the effect on fatigue. And again, because it's the patient that can ex that can um, assess fatigue the best, um, the PRO was um, one of the key endpoints, even though it was considered exploratory. And the PRO that was used was the fatigue, uh, the promise fatigue uh, short form, which had seven questions. Based on the findings from this particular um, PRO uh, data, um, because it showed um, a significant improvement in fatigue, um, the PRO result was included in the labeling of the drug, um, which, which again shows how you know, PROs can um, be used to inform not just regulatory decisions in terms of approval, but also in labeling claims. So I've talked of two examples where PROs have been involved in and have led to impact, but both of them have been later stage trials. Um, 
But now we are finding that there's increasing interest in the use of PROs also for earlier phase trials. So you have early um, phase trials like phase one or two, where people are now starting to think of how to use PROs in this context. I will say that it's not, it, it's, it's a bit controversial because some people feel it's, it doesn't yield enough uh, benefits, but I'll try and highlight how PROs in early phase trials can be of benefit. Traditionally, as we probably all know, um, adverse effects um, rely on uh, clinical tools such as the CTCAE. But the key issue with this is that usually it's underreported by clinicians because it's clinician looking at the patients. Therefore, um, it's logical that there should be a way of capturing patient reporting of adverse events um, and toxicity um, during the early development of drugs. And um, myself and some of my colleagues, we, we explored the use of PROs in this early phase trial in our paper uh, comments to Nature Medicine. And I'll just talk a, a bit more about what we, what we believe can be the contribution of PROs in this context. I'm not sure people on this call are familiar, uh, but in recent times, the, um, the pro CTCAE was developed as a companion to the CTCAE, which was the clinical um, measure. And um, we believe that both of them can be used side by side and complementary when we are assessing the toxicity. Um, and of course, um, you know, when we're trying to plan the management of toxicity in early phase trials. Based on uh, our work, we, we thought that the benefits of PROs in early phase trials would include um, providing a preliminary evidence uh, base for the efficacy of, of the drugs. We do know that we cannot make regulatory decisions based on this kind of result, but it could give us the early signals about how efficacious a drug is from a patient perspective. Um, it could inform future sample size calculations. Um, it could also help us to assess the feasibility of uh, future PRE strategy in a larger trial. And of course, again, it could complement the traditional outcome um, data. So then the question is, um, I, I thought to myself, I should look for an example of how PROs has been used in an early phase um, trial. Um, and there's this study uh, that was exploring the use of nivolumab in patients with advanced hepatocellular carcinoma. And um, this was the phase one, phase two dose escalation and expansion trial. Um, I'm sorry if people are not very familiar with some of those terms. Um, <laughs> Bit, I don't have enough time to explain them, but basically they are, it's a trial where um, they're, they're testing the dose to see how much can be tolerated and how much can be, so can be increased over time. And uh, for this trial, um, so as it's an early phase, it's looking at the safety and efficacy, but mostly the safety. And the PROs that were included here was the EQ5D um, index score and the VAS, which is the visual analog scale. It's not clear if it was considered um, exploratory, but I would assume that this was exploratory um, for this trial. Um, the two arms of this trial, the patients were um, stable. There were no significant changes. Um, and in terms of you know, the, the PRO scores, so what this um, trial showed is that the patients on, in this trial didn't um, deteriorate in comparison to uh, patients on a previous first-line drug, which is called sorafenib. But the drug Nuvolumab is more um, efficacious in terms of response rates. So the PROs, what it has done in this study, even though it's not the key endpoint, is to show that uh, patients uh, can tolerate the drug, um, which can then inform a larger trial. 
Another way PIOs has been evolving in its use when it comes to oncology trials is in the real world evidence research. Um, and so in, at my center, one of the things I was considered was how can we enhance PROs in real world evidence research? And this was a, a, a comment that was written recently on this topic. And this is because real world evidence research is increasingly valued by regulators. And um, like we all know, when you have a clinical trial, it's heavily controlled. Um, and so you don't really know how these drugs would perform when it goes into real world. And it, it's a thing more and more that it's, it will be key to include PROs in such a setting, you know, post authorization, where we can actually capture more of patient experience or, or, or patient outcomes of, um, of treatment. So um, I wasn't able to find a trial um, within oncology, but I found one that had to do with severe asthma. And in this trial, uh, PROs were um, in, included in the um, uh, real world study of lepolizumab. And um, what the PROs showed in this trial um, was that the effectiveness of the drug was um, consistent with what the clinical trials um, provided. While this might not be groundbreaking, um, it does reassure um, that you know, the drugs are performing just as um, was expected. So more and more, um, there's interest in the use of PROs uh, for real world evidence generation. And um, these would, of course, influence and support labeling claims, reimbursement, and health policy uh, decision making. And more and more, like I say, the regulators are interested in this um, field. However, there's not much guidance around how PROs can be used in real world evidence research. So, um, a PhD student who I'm supervising, Conrad, is starting to look at this, um, this space. Uh, and hopefully in time, we'll be able to develop some guidance to inform how PROs can be used in regulatory, uh, in real world evidence research. I'd like to conclude by saying that the role of PROs in oncology clinical trials is evolving um, and there are exciting times ahead. Um, PRO data could inform the design of future trials, regulatory approvals and labeling claims. Um, we need to work alongside patients, actively with patients, because it's only when we do that we'll be able to realize the full benefits and the full potential of PROs in oncology research. And um, I will say that the tide is turning and we would hopefully in time realize the benefits of the use of PROs in, in research uh, to the society uh, in terms of uh, better health outcomes and the use of um, resources. Here are some of the references for those who are interested um, to look further um, and have my contact. And I'll say thank you very much for listening. Um, and I'd like to take questions when when the time comes. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Lee. Um, that was I found that very encouraging. So uh, yes, here, here, round of applause, please. <laughs> um, the I think my. Uh, ugly duckling analogy uh, worked quite well with your with your talk which uh, <laughs> uh, is a relief I have to say um, but I do believe that as you do clearly that the swan uh, is now emerging and is uh, is going to start swimming alongside um, the other colleagues of medical research so thank you Lee and uh, we'll come back to you during the questions I'm quite sure our next speaker is Dagmara Kulis from EORTC. Uh, Dagmara is uh, a member of the Quality of Life group team and she has a very strong interest in the uh, EORTC item library. And I'm going to leave her to explain exactly what that is. So Dagmara, over to you. Thank you. Uh, do you see my slides correctly uh, or is it still in the 
it's in the edit mode, so you need to be in the display mode. Of course, because of the two screens, it gets complicated. I will just <laughs> plug the other screen and maybe that will help. I hope. Yes, now that should be fine. Is it now okay? No, we're not. Ah, yes, we've got it. Yes. Yeah. Well, okay, good. <laughs> okay, so uh, yes, as uh, Roger said, uh, I am a member of the quality of life department at the RTC. The RTC, for those of you that don't know the organization, stands for the European Organization for Research and Treatment of Cancer. Um, and um, I'm a translator by training, and I started uh, my work at the RTC taking care of the translations of the questionnaires uh, to measure quality of life of cancer patients that are, of course, needed in all the languages that uh, patients speak. But uh, over the course of my career, uh, yeah, it has expanded into a lot of other things. Among them is the item library, which is uh, indeed my um, yeah, one of my main interests at, at the moment. So um, what is the item library? Uh, here you can uh, see the website. Uh, that's the address. Uh, and everybody is uh, very welcome to visit the website and uh, get uh, access, which is for free. It requires uh, signing an access agreement, but that's a very quick process. Um, and then you get the uh, um, everything that we have in the item library, which is slide, come on, yes, which is an online dat database of all the questionnaires and items that the quality of life group has ever, ever, ever developed. And uh, the quality of life group has been developing questionnaires for the past almost 40 years. So there is uh, a lot of uh, measures in the in the database. We also have all the translations of those questionnaires. Um, and that's, again, a whole lot of material because, for example, one of the main questionnaires that we have, the C30, has been by now translated into more than 120 different languages. And so, um, we have all the items, so the questions that were developed according to the ERTC guidelines and all the translations that were developed following the ERTC translation procedure. Um, so very strictly regulated um, uh, yeah, development of both. Everything is in the, um, in the online item library. Um, but so first thing is, how do we develop good items that we can then put in the item library and then we can use further on? So, of course, that will be about the URTC uh, process, uh, but uh, it uh, does more or less correspond with the, the general um, idea on development of questionnaires that's in the field. So we follow a four phase module development process. Um, it starts with collecting issues uh, that are specific to the type of disease, uh, the site, the population. Uh, those are collected by literature reviews, by um, checking what is already there when it comes to questionnaires and uh, PRO measures, uh, and by doing interviews with both patients and healthcare providers. Those issues are very like sort of general terms like keywords that uh, describe the problems, the symptoms, the adverse effects from treatment uh, and so on that the patients um, uh, encounter in their daily life. Um, and then those are um, those are then evaluated by patients and healthcare providers to give uh, scores on their importance and relevance uh, so that we can choose the most important ones that have to then be included in the questionnaire. Of course, when you talk about issues, there, the, the list of issues might be like 90, more than 100 different issues, uh, and we cannot make a questionnaire that will be that long because that will not be feasible for uh, administration. So we have to somehow choose the most uh, relevant and important ones, and that's uh, done by the, um, by the evaluation by both patients and healthcare providers. Then in phase two, we turn issues into items. Um, so um, from those very general keywords, we arrive at a question that can be included in the questionnaire. The important thing here is that for each keyword and issue, you can, um, you can make a number of 
questions that measure different aspects of the of the issue. So you can ask about the presence of a symptom, the severity, the burden that it has on the on the patient. So it's very important to think about what you want to measure with the specific question to make the question right. Um, and for that, we also use the item library. Uh, we can very easily consult uh, what has already been developed when it comes to a specific issue. So for example, just by putting the keyword swallowing, you can see all the items that pertain to problems with swallowing to the presence of um, yeah, problem, problems uh, with, with that. Um, in daily life. So um, those questions can then be reused uh, and just the wording that is already tested and we know that it works can be included in the new questionnaire. Uh, we also perform uh, a translatability assessment. So uh, basically we just analyze every uh, new question to see if it's good. We know from experience and from the yeah, general um, translation and linguistic rules uh, what uh, can be a problem later on in both the understanding of the question and when it when we actually have to translate them. So this is a very uh, fake example. Luckily enough, we don't have questions that are that bad. Uh, this is just something I made up to include as many uh, problems as possible in one uh, in one question. So here, what we would definitely comment on, this is a very long question, uh, very complex, so it would get even more. Uh, complex and long in certain languages. Uh, it is double barreled. So basically it asks about two different things. So it might be confusing to patients who experience only one of those two, two issues. It has a negative, which might be very difficult in translation and in uh, then answering the, the question with the response scale. It has an idiom, which of course uh, idioms are always quite difficult to translate because uh, yeah, you cannot just treat them literally and they might change, uh, like shift meaning uh, when, tr when, when uh, translated into another language. Um, it has a word like troubled. We know uh, this is uh, a difficult word that has many sort of different meanings in English and it uh, causes a lot of translation problems. So we always uh, discourage uh, investigators from including that in, in questions. And we also check if the if the question fits the response scale that we use. We use most of the time a Likert scale from not at all to very much. So we have to make sure that that scale fits the, the, the question and it can be answered with, uh, with those response options. Um, then, because we always develop our questionnaires in a multicultural, multi-country setting, we have to translate that preliminary questionnaire that we developed um, so that it can be used in the further phases. Um, we follow a very strict translation process, so we do two forward translations that are then reconciled into one optimal version. That optimal version is then back translated into English and sent to us uh, at the URTC for review. Um, then we do pilot testing on patients, a review, a proofreading, and then the, the translation is uh, finalized. Um, it is quite a long process and it requires a lot of people and it takes normally around three, four months to, to finalize. But uh, of course, we have to make sure that every single language version measures the same thing as the source version of the questionnaire. So the next phase of the development is the pilot testing. Um, Basically, patients get the questionnaire, they fill it in, and then they are interviewed about their experience. Um, in this, we focus on understandability of questions, whether there are any difficult words, any, any problems uh, with confusing items, uh, with very upsetting uh, issues, uh, and so on. Um, and then we analyze the, the comments that patients make in order to adapt the questionnaire. We can reward it, we can uh, add explanations if there are some um, expressions that are not very understandable, or we can just uh, delete items that don't work well. Um, and we make those changes depending on um, on the comments, uh, either in English and then all the other translations or on the level of a translation, depending, of course, um, how major the, the problem is. 
So once we know that our, our questionnaire is uh, well understood by the patients, it can be tested in the phase four for all its uh, psychometric qualities. And that's like a really uh, big uh, study with multiple countries uh, and uh, preferably even multiple uh, big cultural uh, regions with hundreds of patients. Um, and once that is done, we can consider the questionnaire validated. Um, the problem with that is that it's a very long process, and uh, yeah, here it says if you do not do not have six years to develop a questionnaire, six years is actually very optimistic for a full development of a questionnaire like that. We had cases where it was more than a decade, and of course, uh, that is a long time. A lot of things can change in the meantime, and also you require hundreds of patients to test the questionnaire on. So it is it, it, it's a process that uh, is very um, resource and time um, uh, yeah, it requires a lot of uh, a lot of work. Uh, so that's where we have the RTC item library that can help. Um, the RTC item library was uh, first developed as a just a reference tool for the RTC quality of life group for uh, just checking what we already have and not reinvent the the wheel each time a new item has to be worded. But now it also serves as a part of the of the. Uh, measurement strategy that uh, allows for um, measuring item uh, measuring issues that are not included in a in a questionnaire that we already have because let's think of a case where a questionnaire took 10 years to develop um, in the meantime the treatments changed and patients experience some new adverse effects and some new symptoms or problems that are not uh, part of the existing measure. This is why we can uh, use the item library to create an item list that is an add-on to, um, to the validated measures. So we can then choose from the more than 1000 questions that we have in the item library and uh, create a custom uh, item list uh, that um, covers those issues. So for example, if we have a, a, a study in which we want to assess that list of uh, problems and symptoms, we know that the QLQ C30, so our, C, uh, the, our core questionnaire with 30 questions will cover those, uh, those uh, problems. Then a module that is specific to the disease, let's say lung cancer module covers those. Um, but then we are still missing uh, something that will uh, assess the remaining ones, and those can be covered by an item list created with the item library. Um, and then another use uh, of the item library is to help with uh, more difficult development cases. And um, yeah, Olga will uh, talk a bit more about that. But um, for the sarcoma questionnaire, uh, we had uh, long dis discussions on how to handle it, uh, given the need for uh, so many patients and the heterogeneity of the disease. And um, with the item library and how it works, uh, we have come up with a model that will allow us to collect the issues and then group them by um, by the different aspects of the, the different types of the disease and create a sarcoma item library with uh, validated tested items. And then from those, we will have will be able to make specific item lists for for studies and uh, research depending on the types and, and group the types of the disease and the groups of patients. Um, and uh, the, all the items will go through the same uh, process of validation, but then they will be a specific uh, a specific item library um, that will be ready for use. So to conclude, uh, good questionnaires take long time to develop. It's not enough to just uh, think, oh, I want to include some uh, PROs in my uh, research, so I'll write down a couple of questions uh, on a piece of paper. Uh, that's, that's not a good approach. Um, we try to consider different aspects of, of the, the construction of a questionnaire, um, and we can speed up the process a bit with the item library and uh, it allows for uh, a lot of flexibility in, in the development. Thank you very much. And once again, uh, I invite you to visit the item library and uh, see for yourself uh, what's in there.
Th thank you, Dagmara. Um, I'm a, I have access to the item library. It's a very simple process, but you, you do have to sign an agreement with um, EORTC to do it. Uh, but it is really fascinating going in there, and I've been able to use the library myself over the last uh, year as I've been advising a surgical study in Newcastle, um, which wants to move in, in the direction of, uh, uh, of PROs uh, for uh, one of its uh, outcome measures. And um, uh, the library has been really useful to me to help me understand how I can help them which is, uh, I think, a patient perspective we often forget. We need to have the questions we ask ourselves so that we can ask the right questions when it comes to being involved with researchers. Um, a thought there to, to continue Thank on. You, but I'm very happy to hear that you find it useful. Thank you. Well, thanks, Dagmara. <laughs> it, it, it's, it has been very useful. Um, now, Olga Husson, Dr. Olga Husson, leads... Uh, a research group in uh, uh, Amsterdam, which uh, uh, has been very heavily involved with um, PROs amongst uh, all the other things it does. Um, and Olga has been working with Dagmara and the Quality of Life group on these sarcoma uh, PRO issues. And this is where I hope we're going to see the, the ugly duckling really sprouting its white feathers uh, as a, um, a, a full-grown swan. So, Olga, I have uh, lots of uh, promise in what you have, uh, of what you're doing. Uh, so uh, please tell us all about it. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Roger, for this uh, kind introduction. Uh, is my screen in full uh, screen mode is now? Yes, it is. Oh, perfect. Um, so I will first tell a little bit about the background of our sarcoma specific uh, project, which we are currently running within the ERTC quality of life group. Because in the last decade, uh, there's quite some research uh, published uh, on health related quality of life, however, all from a psychosocial perspective. As you can see, four review papers. However, uh, in the more clinical oriented research, um, health related quality of life is still rarely incorporated. For example, uh, the special issue that is shown on the slide uh, of the Journal of Clinical uh, Oncology, uh, which was published in 2017 about relevant diagnostic and therapeutic aspects of sarcoma care. Um, however, there was almost no reference to the patient uh, perspective on these advances in uh, care. So we thought we write a reply to this uh, special issue and we argued that if you really want to make a difference and uh, truly provide personalized care and conduct trials that are relevant uh, relevance for patients, we should routinely involve patients in the trial design, but most importantly, integrate uh, health related quality of life assessments into clinical practice and research. So more recently, uh, we conducted uh, a study among the SPAN members, uh, actually it was called the Sarcoma Priority Setting Partnership Exercise, where we asked uh, sarcoma patients and their informal caregivers to come up with the most important uh, unaddressed research questions from their point of view. And uh, 24 uh, questions were identified, and seven of them were related to health related quality of life. So, this again um, was a strong rational or is a strong rational to focus on health related quality of life for sarcoma patients. So, uh, what do we know about health related quality of life? Um, so, as said, patient reported outcomes are not after, often uh, assessed, but when assessed, health related quality of life is most commonly assessed. And after that, um, functional outcomes, aspects of mental health, and specific symptoms like uh, pain or fatigue are assessed. And when we focus on health related quality of life uh, specifically, most studies show that sarcoma patients or sarcoma survivors suffer from poor health related quality of life compared to the general population. So um, one good example of a study that is recently uh, conducted is the German PROSA study. 
uh, led by Martin Eichler, uh, also part of the ERTC Quality of Life group. And they asked sarcoma patients and survivors in follow-up to complete a one-off questionnaire to assess the health-related quality of life. And they used the ERTC QOQ uh, C30 uh, for this purpose. And as Dagmara uh, already told, this is a more cancer generic uh, questionnaire. Uh, in this German study, over uh, 1,100 patients participated, and the graph on the slide shows the results of the uh, study. And the light gray bars uh, are the sarcoma patients, and the dark gray bars are the uh, uh, scores of the uh, general German population, and higher scores indicate better functioning. And what this uh, slide shows is that sarcoma patients uh, uh, in treatment, but also in follow-up, have lower scores compared to the German population. And the biggest differences are uh, seen in role functioning, uh, emotional functioning, and social functioning. Well, this uh, German study um, provided, of course, very important uh, data. However, we would also like to know uh, who is at risk for poor health-related quality of life. And as we all know, and also Dagmara mentioned it in her talk, um, we know that sar sarcomas are very heterogeneous with regards to uh, subtypes, uh, histological and molecular subtypes, uh, ages, um, uh, it can occur at any age, but also the location of the sarcoma and of course the treatment the patient uh, receives. And in the next slides, I will give some examples of how these factors um, are associated with health-related quality of life. So first, uh, the, the sarcoma location. Uh, we published, we recently published a systematic literature review about the impact of sarcoma location uh, on health-related quality of life. This was published in ESMO Open. And um, we identified uh, 87 patients focusing on health-related quality of life of sarcoma patients. And most, most studies which were included in this review focused on sarcoma in general, or on uh, patients with uh, sarcomas uh, of the extremities. And the main results are shown on the slide. And it was found that reduced physical functioning and a disability in uh, sarcoma of the extremities and axial skeleton were most often reported in, in these two groups. In head and neck sarcoma patients, uh, more neurological symptoms uh, were found with all a significant impact on the mental well being of these patients. Um, the treatment for retroperitoneal sarcoma leads to functional limitations and gastrointestinal problems. And sarcoma of the chest and urogenital organs were not investigated at all. So with regard to health-related quality of life, uh, of course. Um, and in patients with metastatic sarcoma, the tumor location was not really uh, uh, Im impacted, uh, did not have an impact on health-related quality of life. So in the Netherlands, we uh, conducted a quite, quite similar study to the German study, which I just uh, mentioned. We uh, performed a questionnaire study among uh, almost 1,100 sarcoma patients diagnosed uh, two to 10 years earlier, aged 18 years or older. And uh, we used uh, also the ERTC QQC30 to assess health-related quality of life. But we had a specific focus on the impact of tumor location on uh, health-related quality of life. And we divided the patient sample into nine subgroup, uh, subgroups based on primary sarcoma location. So uh, this slide shows some of the results. In the top uh, four panels, you can see the functioning scores, where a higher score uh, means better functioning. And uh, in the four lower panels, uh, the symptom scores are showed. And in this case, a higher score indicates more symptoms. Uh, and what you can see is that the orange bar, which are the actual skeleton sarcomas, perform worse on um, the functioning scores, but also on the symptom scores compared to all other tumor locations. And all the other bars are quite comparable uh, with each other. So it really shows that actual skeleton sarcomas perform worse. Um, and um, when you have a closer look, um, the skin sarcoma group had the highest functioning uh, levels and the lowest symptom uh, skills um, in our study. 
So um, what, which was something that was also mentioned by uh, Dag Mare is that the EOTC QOQC30 is quite a generic questionnaire. So that's why we added some uh, treatment and location specific symptoms to our questionnaire uh, package of that Dutch study I uh, just described. And uh, this slide shows uh, an example of the questions we added for the sarcoma patients who underwent surgery of the cervix, uterus or ovaries. We added the 10 questions that uh, are mentioned on the slide. And what you can see is that um, patients had five, very high scores on, uh, for example, flatulence and complaints uh, similar to menopause, but also pain in the back, uh, hurry to uh, toilet uh, with regard to urine, um, abdominal cramps and a blooded feeling in the abdomen. So this shows that um, the, the uh, health related quality of life is quite a complex construct because for this specific subgroup, you see that uh, completely different um, issues are of relevance, which are not part of the EOTC QOQC 30 at the moment. So uh, tumor location is very important, but another uh, important factor to incorporate in research is the age of sarcoma patients. So based on the same Dutch study data, um, we also made a comparison between the different age uh, groups. So we stratified our sample into three age groups. So the AYA cancer patients, 18 to 39 years of age, uh, the middle-aged patients, 40 to um, uh, I think in 69 years of age and the elderly patients 70 years or older. And what we did, so the top panel uh, shows the AYA cancer, so sarcoma cancer patients, and the lower panel are the elderly uh, sarcoma cancer patients. Um, and we compared each age group with um, um, their uh, subsequent um, uh, normative population, so age and sex matched. And what you can see in all the panels is that the sarcoma patients score worse so that the green bars are lower than the normative population. But when you have a closer look and specifically look at the emotional functioning, uh, the cognitive functioning uh, and the social functioning skills, you see that the differences uh, for the AYA survivors with their respective um, normative population are much higher than or larger than for the elderly uh, sarcoma patients with respect to their uh, normative population. And it actually indicates that the impact of a sarcoma and its treatment has a larger, um, what is larger than for um, elderly sarcoma patients. So we also need to know why is this impact larger? And within the ERTC, we are currently developing an AYA module. So uh, a module questionnaire that will assess the age specific aspects of having cancer. And what we see is that issues around uh, going back to school, um, um, what about my career, social isolation are all very important for the young age group. And um, age is therefore also a very uh, important aspect to incorporate in a health-related quality of life measurement strategy for uh, sarcoma uh, patients. So uh, another fa factor of importance for health-related quality of life is treatment. So we again used the Dutch uh, data um, uh, for a comparison between, uh, treat, uh, to, between four treatment uh, groups. So we selected the locally advanced extremity uh, soft tissue sarcoma patients who end, underwent one uh, of the following four treatments. So we had the isolated lymph perfusion group who also underwent resection. We had the extended resection group, the amputation group, and the isolated lymph perfusion group who underwent an amputation later on. And the first two bars in the graph show the results re uh, with regards to uh, health-related quality of life. So again, the C30 scores, but then for physical and for role functioning. And what you can see 
is that um, the isolated limb perfusion group uh, and the extended uh, resection group score, score much better on physical as well as on role functioning compared to the two groups that uh, underwent an amputation. So this means that an amputation has a, a significant impact uh, on the health related quality of life. However, we do not know what specific aspects are uh, impacted because amputation specific uh, questions were not part of um, the questionnaire uh, package. So again, it shows that we need to incorporate um, treatment specific um, issues into a health related quality of life uh, strategy. Then uh, disease stage, which, which is another uh, factor. Uh, a recently uh, published uh, publication uh, on a qualitative study uh, showed um, that actually patients with metastatic, sarcoma patients with metastatic disease have a kind of common pathway. So they report quite similar symptoms. And um, um, well, Potentially, the ERTC uh, Q or QC30 is a perfect instrument uh, for this uh, group or even the shorter version for palliative patients, the PAL-15. Compared to uh, patients, sarcoma patients with localized disease, which show much more diversity in the complaints uh, they have. Uh, for localized patients, the complaints are more related to the treatment, to their age, um, to the uh, sarcoma location, which is not the case for patients with metastatic disease who all report kind of uh, similar symptoms. So um, then the question arises, of course, how can we best um, measure health related quality of life um, in sarcoma patients? As said, most of the previously pub published studies only use a generic or a cancer generic um, uh, instrument, um, but we need a more specific sarcoma uh, measurement strategy for health-related quality of life. But what Dagmar I just mentioned is that it is very difficult because of the heterogeneity of the disease in terms of subtypes, presentation, age, treatment, and also the limited patient numbers to come up with a good measurement uh, uh, to, to use one measurement instrument to assess all of that. And there the ERTC item library comes into place because the ERTC item library can easily be used to select the most relevant uh, items for specific sarcoma subgroups. Uh, and of course, it also really depends on the aim of a study or a research project, which um, um, health related quality of life issues are of relevance. But then the question arises, how do we know which items are relevant for which subgroup of sarcoma patients? So that's the aim of the current ongoing EOTC project, uh, where we are going to raise standards for health-related quality of life measurement in sarcoma patients. And we recently finished the first phase of uh, this project. And that was um, that had the aim to compile an exhaustive list of health related quality of life issues relevant to sarcoma patients. So we performed a literature review. We interviewed 175 uh, patients um, and also some healthcare professionals. So the results of the literature uh, review um, I just, uh, yeah, I just discussed that, but um, out of the review, we could select 274 different health-related quality of life um, issues. So these are quite a lot. And as I said, we also performed um, uh, quite a lot of interviews with sarcoma patients, um, also with thoracic and breast sarcoma patients. And I will give you some examples uh, of the issues that, that came out of uh, those interviews. So the figures uh, shown on the slides show the uh, health related quality of life issues in the physical, mental and social health domains of the thoracic and the breast sarcoma patients. And what you can see is that the physical issues mentioned by both groups uh, are related to fatigue, sleep disturbances, pain, uh, wound infections, and symptoms related to chemotherapy and radiotherapy. However, um, 
uh, tightness in the back and restrictions in performing tasks above uh, arm heat were specific physical issues for breast sarcoma patients, uh, whereas respiratory problems were only mentioned for thoracic uh, sarcoma patients. So you can see that there's a, a difference. Both groups, however, um, uh, reported uh, complaints with regards to body image, uh, mood, fear of recurrence, and living with uncertainty. And both groups also mentioned uh, issues around uh, social life, like uh, challenges in work, uh, relationships, financial difficulties, loss of independence and limitations in social activities. So we uh, also performed uh, interviews uh, with uterine sarcoma patients. And uh, well, I can show you a similar uh, figure, but the issues that came out for this group were of course, um, uh, slightly different uh, compared to the um, thoracic and the breast sarcoma patients. But uh, what we also did for the uterine sarcoma patients is that we asked the patients to rate the ERTC QRQC30 and the ERTC QRQN24, which is the endometrium cancer uh, module because we were specifically interested uh, if patients think that the items from the so, so, sarcoma patients think that the items from the endometrium cancer module are relevant for them because the tumor is on the same location. And the interesting thing is that almost um, all questions of the endometrium uh, module were rated as relevant by the uterine sarcoma patients. So that means actually that we can um, apply at least part of the endometrium module items, which are part of the ERTC item library, to this uterine sarcoma patient group. However, I must also say that there were some specific issues that are not uh, part of the endometrium module, for example, lack of knowledge about sarcoma, uh, shock of diagnosis and menopausal symptoms um, that um, should be added to a uterine sarcoma specific item list. So after uh, the 175 interviews, you, we had a huge, huge list of um, um, health-related quality of life issues, actually around 1,800. And we discussed these codes with patients and clinicians and with our team of researchers. And we tried to uh, create a more comprehensive uh, issue list. So we now have an issue list of 219 um, issues. Uh, 148 biological or physical uh, issues, 41 psychological and 30 social uh, issues. And these issue lists will be used in the second part of our work where we are going to ask the uh, 475 patients to rate this um, issue list on relevance and importance and also to indicate relevant missing items from the list. Um, and based on, uh, based on the answers of patients, we will be able to say, to give better advice on which items are relevant for which sarcoma patient groups. And this will be very helpful for future research and care uh, initiatives because then the EOTC item library or the sarcoma EOTC item library can be used um, to, to create item lists for these uh, purposes. So if you would like to know more about this project, we have published our study protocol uh, in cancers and I'm happy uh, to share that uh, with you, of course. So. This was uh, my presentation. Thank, thank you, Olga. Uh, you covered an enormous amount of background there. And between you and Dag Dagmara, I think we have a, an impression now of a, a really valuable body of tools, uh, which are not quite there yet, but are emerging uh, in the sarcoma domain and which we would want to see used in every sarcoma study, frankly. Um, and the beauty is uh, the individual uh, outcomes that need to be looked at will have their own uh, set of questions. So each study can compile a tool. And if you take on Lee's idea that uh, using technology, we can actually create adaptive questionnaires um, it becomes very powerful. 
And that's the way I would like to see things moving. And I think uh, other, others will agree with that. And this brings us quite logically to our fourth presentation, which is looking at issues of survivorship, because this is the ultimate patient outcome. How well or badly it's reported is a, uh, it, it, it is uh, a question which I think Richard will probably uh, talk about. But Richard led or was one of the leaders of uh, a study we ran in the UK, which was looking at in the context of living beyond and with cancer. Uh, and what you know, what what are the priorities in research there? And uh, I would like to see. Uh, some of the messages that I know that Richard will bring through, bring forward, come through in our work in researching sarcoma. So, Richard, uh, over to you to introduce yourself further. Vielen Dank, Roger. Good morning, Frankfurt. I hope everyone can hear me and see the screen. Brilliant. Um, well, having been biased towards our German friends there, uh, bonjour, buenos dias, ciao, grazie, hello, hola, hey, hi, and top of the morning to you. My name's Richard Stevens. I am a blood cancer patient, not a sarcoma patient, but I was part of the Project Roger outline, which ran for two years in 2017 and 2018. Three, over 3,000 cancer patients took part in it throughout the UK. And what we did was try to find the top questions, the top research questions where we patients felt we were not getting answers to our questions about living with and beyond cancer. I will try to focus today on the issue of beyond cancer, but when you come to see the questions, you will see some of them are very definitely living with it. So some work, had already been done by 2017 and 2018, uh, and some work was underway. So in sarcoma, in many respects, you are, as a group of, of patient advocates, uh, well ahead of the game, certainly compared with, uh, with other cancers on this issue. Roger himself has written a brilliant paper about patient reported outcomes in the Journal of Research Involvement and Engagement. It's free to sign up to the mailing list, by the way, please do. The NCRI then did its project, which is the third bullet point there, so you can click on that link any time you like and go and look it all up. EORTC, of course, has a survivorship programme, and the Living With and Beyond Cancer results from the UK were fed into that programme in May 2019. European Horizons Cancer is the opportunity for all of us involved in patient groups to actually press this issue of survivorship. It's not just about diagnosis and cure, it's what do you do with the thousands and later on the millions of cancer survivors. And even the biobankers are getting involved in this issue because the importance of biobanking does trigger correct diagnosis, correct treatment, personalised medicine, but actually you then need to start looking at, well, what's causing side effects, late effects, which drugs work better than others, are there new surgical techniques, uh, is there something cellular going on that we need to be looking at? So the survey came out with 26 priority questions. I am going to show you all 26, but we won't be talking about all of them. They do relate across the piece. That they relate to all cancers, all age groups over the age of 16, but every single one you can narrow it down by adding in sarcoma, or indeed in France. Warren, I wrote the slide before I knew you were going to ask a question in chat, or in people age 50, 70, or in any particular ethnic group. I've picked on Anglo-Saxons so that nobody else thinks I'm picking on them. You could, of course, also simply ask it for participants in this study. And one of the things I think researchers are missing is embedding quality of life sub-studies, not just using quals and proms, but actually embedding proper research studies in their clinical trials and actually having qual or proms as a joint primary endpoint. That'll, 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 that'll shock a few people, but it's worth doing. Let's have a look at some of the questions. By the way, the first 10 questions I'm going to show you are the top 10 but unfortunately on these slides, they are shown with the wrong numbering in the wrong order. Um, however, if you look at that second one, which isn't 
number two on the priority list. But if you just look at that second one, that's why the biobankers are getting involved. It's those of us who are suffering side effects or indeed late effects of our treatments. So the, the big survivorship issue there is all this business about, oh, you've, you've been cured of cancer, you can have your normal life back. Well, actually, often, no, we can't. Uh, so uh, is there a biological cause for all that? Two more links at the bottom if you want to know more about this project, how we did it, and so on. Lifestyle changes are always uh, very popular. Prediction is always very popular. The best models of delivering long-term cancer care, which means you don't just tell people, hey, well done, the cancer's cured, go away, we'll see you one day every year and you can get on with your normal life. No, we can't. At the bottom, there's a link to some of the research work that's been going on in the UK on these topics since 2018. There's not enough happening, especially after COVID when nobody's got any money anyway, but there is some. Moving on, it's that bottom question, which isn't really number 10, but the bottom question, the psychological impact. That really interests me because the blood cancer I had at the time, I was told it was likely to come back. It never has, but I'm now told that I'm at risk of another cancer. But this fear of recurrence or of secondary cancer is always there. And again, I come back to this, you leave the surgery, well done, you can get your normal life back. In here, in my head, my life is never gonna be normal again. So what are the most effective ways of stopping it coming back? or perhaps postponing it? Really interesting question. Lord knows how anyone can research it, but it's, it's got to be important that somebody does. Other questions on there. The 13, coping with specific fear and anxiety about recurrence. And then 14, as a progression on from that, mental health conditions or perhaps emotional health conditions, but, it, but it's, it's all basically the same. It's, how do we get through what's going on in here? And we do know from just from statistics from treatment that cancer patients, when they're told they've got the all clear, there is a very high rate among us where we then fall into depression. Uh, and what we don't yet know is how many of those, because no one's looked at it, how many of those are actually linked to people where their cancer is likely to recur and they've been told it will or indeed people whose treatment has been so bad that all this stuff about good luck with your normal life just really does not apply. Uh, Rog, you're probably one of those yourself. Moving on again, I'm hoping each time you, you do get a bit of time to read what's on the slides, even if it's not the point I've been talking about. Um, the, the, the two in there that really interest me are number 17, which is number 17, um, the psychological and social impacts on children, or if you're a young person, if you're, if you're diagnosed in your 20s and 30s, the psychological impact on your parents of the thought that they might be losing a child before they go, in the wrong order of things. But actually kids, kids whose parents have got cancer and who then get their mummy or daddy back only to find out or be told that actually mummy or daddy may get sick again. This is, this is really, really important stuff for how we get our normal lives back. These things have to be addressed. Uh, and then the other, the other issues there about rare and less common cancers at the bottom, clearly that is sarcoma. Question 21. It's interesting that we've had three presentations, three excellent, professional, thorough, wonderful presentations and nobody's actually mentioned people's sex lives, which for most of us is actually quite important in life. Uh, and I, I, I do wonder what items there may be uh, in the EORTC items library around specifically measuring that. I'm sure there's lots of questions about how is your relationship with your partner, but this question is much more specific. What about people who live alone? Okay, that, that's another psychological one. Spiritual care needs. And number 25, the optimal follow-up approach. 
you know, if, if something is likely to recur, can we use artificial intelligence to actually start finding out when it is most likely re to recur for particular groups of people and actually tailor our follow up to that? Because actually you're not following up the first cancer, you're trying to pick up the next time or the recurrence. And this is, a, again, something that, that I think opens a pathway to the future for researchers. The bottom is something that uh, Roger and a chap called Derek Stewart uh, told me many, many years ago, that actually the purpose of research, if we get it right, should not just be to put years on my life. It is actually to put life and a quality of life in the years I have got left. That's it, Rog. It's a gallop through, but I'm sure you want to have time for people to ask questions of all the panelists. Thank you, Richard. That that was a bit of a gallop, but it was, uh, I think, very full. And um, I'm sure you won't mind if we, after after this session, share those slides with um, uh, the you know with anyone who wants to receive them. If, if, before they get shared, I'd just like to double check the numbering. But, but yeah. <laughs> okay. Fine. Uh, leave, leave that, leave that with, you, with you to negotiate with Mickey. Thank you. Um, the, uh, the one comment that has immediately come back, uh, Dagmara has uh, said in the, in the chat, we do cover sexual issues and we have a specific questionnaire in the item library on sexual health. So um, uh, I'll leave you to check that in due course and, uh, uh, and, and maybe comment. Um, uh, but sorry, Roger, I, I will come back on that because my next question yeah, then I'm... is how do we patients best, and this is this is for everybody, how do we best get that across to researchers? How do we embed the studies that need to be embedded? And, and as we found out in our survey, many of these questions for particular groups of people and for particular cancers do have research-based evidence to support changes in clinical practice, changes in healthcare pathways, but they're not being implemented largely because the people at the front line, patients and nurses and doctors in hospitals, don't know they exist, let alone the regulators or the Royal Colleges or the European organization of this, that or the other, let alone them changing their guidelines. We have lots to do to change research into advocacy, into implementation. I'll stop ranting now. <laughs> no, uh, it's actually very close to one of uh, Spain's core themes, which is we're looking for uh, the evidence-based advocacy, and that that's what that's what you're pointing to. Um, very true. Um, right, I, I think you now see how my uh, ugly duckling analogy um, works. Um, the ugly duckling is growing up. Uh, it's acquiring its adult plumage, uh, and uh, once it has uh, got all the nice smooth feathers and the elegance of its uh, of its head and so on, um, which uh, you know Richard, Richard is pointing to, uh, we we will we will have a swan to be proud of. Uh, we're not there yet, but we're getting there, and what everyone is doing is pointing to that. So uh, I don't see any hands up in the online audience are there in the uh, the room uh, mickey no this is Catherine. no at the moment we don't have any questions in the room oh well but it fall, falls to me then to 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 ask a question um and dagmara if we have a patient who wants to um uh you know get access to the library and they can go through the process for that uh and they see in there um that there are uh maybe a, a whole group of questions on a particular uh, outcome area that they're interested in seeing used in the study that they're involved with. How do they go about getting the researchers to actually come through and get those questions and get, be allowed to use them? Well, um, getting, getting the actual questions, questionnaires is quite easy and in academic research it's for free, uh, there are no fees, uh, so yeah, the, the actual just download of the questionnaire or making an item list is very easy and uh, does not require much time, the more of a problem is I presume getting the researchers to uh, want to implement the, the PROs and yeah. Um, 
we try to, of course, educate uh, people um, on the importance of quality of life and the use of PROs. Um, but I, I agree that there is still a long way to go on that. But uh, Olga, as a clinician, maybe can comment a bit more. <laughs> Olga? Well, um, I, I do think um, indeed what, what Dagmar said, it's first of all important that uh, health-related quality of life will be incorporated in all initiatives. But I also do think that um, we hope to finish our um, ERTC project uh, by the end of the year. Uh, and then we will provide clear guidelines on which aspects are important for which sarcoma subgroup. And hopefully we can write some guidelines which, which can be used by patients and clinicians to uh, show what's important and to incorporate that in research initiatives and in clinical practice, of course, because I do think now it's also quite a challenge because those guidelines are not there yet. Um, what to add. And then, of course, again, the patient voice is very important, like what Richard is saying, uh, sexual issues. If that's a specific topic of interest, then patients should go <laughs> to the clinicians and researchers and say, well, this is important. And there are quite uh, some issues uh, or items, I must say, in the item library on sexual dysfunction, but also more the psychological aspects, uh, um, enjoying sex, um, fear of having sex because of issues. So there's quite a lot uh, in there already, but people have to find it. Yeah, yeah. ask the right questions again. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Lee, the, the challenge uh, that I've seen when I've, in the work that I've done with uh, uh, you and with your, your, your team in Birmingham, is actually getting patients to be involved. You're very good as a, as a team. You've got a, a collection of, I'm not sure how many, eight or 10 patients that work with you. But what advice would you be able to give uh, to our patients here um, about getting involved with their researchers in their country? Is there, is there anything that comes to mind? Well, thanks. Um, I think patients, at, from my discussions with patients, I think the main issue with patients being involved is that patients sometimes feel they've got nothing to give, that they don't know enough. So I've spoken to loads of patients, and usually when you start off, they, uh, they'll, they'll start by saying, well, they don't really know much about, you know, the science of the condition. So what can they really bring to the table? And I think what what I would say is patients should recognize the fact that um, they've got a lot to bring. They've got their perspectives, their real life experiences, which as researchers, we don't have. So give, take, going back to this um, talk, I know it's, it's what Richard said, you know, about the sexual function thing. Most researchers, because of, you know, what they perceived from the outside would feel that sexual function probably rates very low in terms of what outcomes our patients um, value. And so the research will be designed in that way. So we need patients to actually come on board and highlight those outcomes that they consider more, you know, priority, you know. So the truth is for research to be relevant, we need patients to help us with the prioritization. And there's no, no way we can know that. It's only when patients tell us. So please, uh, you know, for patients who are thinking about research, never mind your experience, because the truth is, yes, there are some patients who over time, when they've had the condition, they become experts, um, but they have their place. We also need patients who are not experts in the disease who will give their own um, unfiltered and unbiased, because over time when patients you know, become experts, they become advocates which have agendas, but there's a place for patients who don't have any agenda other than you know, their condition. Um, so please, please, um, if people approach you for research, do um, get on board, um, any, any kind of, uh, contribution is appreciated. 
Um, and I think most research teams are beginning to understand and appreciate this. Um, and also, even if you're not approached, um, there's a place for even approaching research teams as patients and saying, you know, do you have patients on board? We would like to be on board. Um, yeah, that's my view. Oh, th thank you, Lee. That, 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 that's a, a lovely appeal. Uh, I'd like to have recorded that, but there we are. Um, uh, you've got a lot of experience on bringing patients in, haven't you, uh, uh, Olga? So do you have a comment on that? I think Catherine wants to say something. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Thank you, Olga. I was just saying we have three people uh, with questions here in the room. So ah. Sorry to interrupt everybody, but I think if you wanted to address them. Denise, would you like to start? Yeah. So this is Denise Ranke. Um, I wanted to ask, um, I know that uh, there seems to be somewhat of a bias when we brought this up to like a study team, designing a study, getting ready to implicate, implement it, that they feel that perhaps um, it will add burden to the study team or that the patients won't answer and then they'll be missing data points. And so um, I, I, I think with many of the new technologies, that's not as, I, I don't think it's as much of a real issue, but I'd like to hear your, your thoughts on that and how we can refute that because sometimes they use it, I think, as a bit of an excuse to not be inclusive. Lee, I know that you've, uh, your group has got experience in the electronic world. You're actually running a few studies with uh, remote uh, data, aren't you? Yes, yes. Um, I think it's all down to education, to be honest, um, for the clinical teams as well as the patients. We found, and some other teams around you know, the world have found that actually you can have good compliance in terms of completion. Um, missing data could be less of a problem if, you know, first of all, you choose measures that uh, are relevant to patients. So if patients consider the measures as relevant and capturing what they consider as important, then they are more likely to complete. So actually it's involving patients from the very beginning is very crucial because without that, you know, just bringing them on at the end or just you know, tagging patient involvement at the end, it doesn't work. Uh, so there's there's a place for education of, of clinical research, but I do agree with that point, you know, it, it is used often as um, excuses for not involving patients, but there's enough evidence to show that actually it doesn't have to be burdensome and patients are willing to complete. Yeah. Richard, you've got your hand up. Is it relevant to this point or a new point? Well, it's relevant. No, it's relevant to this point, certainly, because I, th I think the way the question was framed, that, that that's a really good example. The work on the research team, well, tough luck. For goodness sake, they're being paid to do the extra work. But in terms of patients not not filling things out, that's that's where, as Lee said, that's where you need patient involvement at the early stage. Is it too much of a burden or not? And what can patients do to actually promote it? So when the study is up and running, how often are we going to our networks, to our charities, to our support groups saying, please, please, please fill out these questionnaires. We know it's a pain in the backside, but this will make a difference. And it'll make a difference to people like us. And that's what we want. That's from the heart. I'd like to say patients are more inclined to complete questionnaires when they know that the data is going to be used. If they're sure that you would actually use it and not just complete and just leave it somewhere gathering dust, they are more likely to complete. So well, sometimes we, it's we not published as well, correct? Sometimes yeah. it does not get published in the final manuscript. Yeah, and that's, that's very true. Um, and that was, it's, it's something we've picked up in our work, which we've reported over time. Um, we can't, the sad thing is um, we can't, there is no way we could hold people to publish at all, by all, at all costs, you see. It's, it's sad, but um, more and more teams are starting to publish. Um, and, and I think things would improve, to be honest. But um, yeah, if patients, if patients know it's going to be used, they will complete. So, and I think that's why 
research teams have to make it clear how data will be used. Yeah, the you know in the, the the little bit of work I've done looking at how patients respond to questionnaires, um, so much of it at the end of the day is around the clinic organisation. If questionnaires are being asked in the clinic, a patient that is interrupted in order to go and see their doctor doesn't finish the questionnaire they started while they were waiting. They leave it there and they go home. Result missing data, poor quality. So a lot of a lot of it does come down to very simple frontline management management things. Um, Richard, you 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 flagged that you were going to come back in on that. Well, only briefly. I mean that that's that's all the more reason why we we start putting the surveys on things like our, our own mobile phones and answering them mm. that way. But it, this is also the not publishing thing is just absolutely disgraceful, and people should say so. These people are hiding knowledge, and they should not be hiding knowledge. And if publication costs too much, then put it online, open access. There are sorry, Lee, there is no excuse for not doing it. And we do need that feedback loop. Patients need to know that our efforts are making a difference because that is why we join the research project. For goodness sake, more to the point, can I just remind people, we pay for it. It's either taxation, donation, or it's our healthcare services, which we are funding, or it's our universities, which we are funding. It's our damn money as well as our illness. Get on with it. Researchers work for us. Passionate. Thank you. Yeah, I know Lee agrees with you. Um, the um, let, 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 let's just move on to an, another question. Gerard, you're in the audience, and I think you want to uh, add something to what Olga was saying about the uh, sarcoma research project. Yeah, thank you, um, Roger. Um, Olga mentioned uh, the collaboration that we started uh, around three years ago. I think it's now. Um, uh, with uh, Olga and uh, we net van der Graaf, we had discussions in Amsterdam at that time and we decided to, to start a collaboration to include the patient voice in setting up the um, research agenda for sarcomas. And we are very happy with this collaboration. Um, it took a while to finish the first phase of the project. It has been three years and Olga has made several presentations also at span conferences giving um intermediate results it took a long time for us um and us is uh, olga and her co-workers but also some of the span volunteers participated in the analysis of the research which was quite a lot of work there were open questions and many patients took the opportunity to tell what their experience is with their disease. And it's very important, but it took a while. But we are very happy that uh, just two weeks ago, we had uh, um, the presentation, the, the publication in ESMO Open of the final results of the first phase. Um, here you see the publication, ESMO Open, so open source, uh, you can go to, um, to, this, um, to this publication, every patient can, can read it, and I, um, um, I want to emphasize that we have, um, let me see which is, the, the, we, we had around 264 patients and carers of patients who replied to the questionnaire in several countries among the world, mainly Europe and the United States, but also other parts of the world. Um, and um, the first results of the results of the first phase, it's not working anymore. Is there not another one? I thought that um, it, it resulted in 23 topics for research that were mentioned by the patients. And we will now start shortly the second phase of, of the project where we, where we will prioritize the different issues that were mentioned. For this, I think it's important that we get a response as representative as possible for the whole community worldwide of sarcoma patients. 
and this is where I call for participation of the SPAN, mem span members um, in this second uh, phase of the exercise, which we really <coughs> need badly, participation of all of the SPAN members to translate and to pub publicize this effort and get as many patients as possible to reply to it. I think in the results of the first phase, there is a bias in high income countries, higher educated people. So we need more diversity to get this representativity. So please, SPAN members, help us. Thank you, Gerard. Thank you, Gerard. A really important point. <laughs> You've got one more one more question in the audience, I think. We do. Yes, thank you. Thank you. It's not a quite a question, but rather than discussion. Uh, I'm Ariev. I'm a clinical oncologist from Macedonia, and I'm very glad that um, uh, this uh, subject is raised on about the quality of life of the patients because the quality of life is very very important and knowing all the difficulties that they are faced at the, the beginning of the therapy, because uh, knowing all the physical and mental problems they are facing, uh, we can get better treatment, better success of the treatment, and better quality of life for those patients. About questionnaires, there is not important to be published or to be somewhere where the uh, patients can uh, get them and answer them. The more important is that I totally agree with Lee that everybody should be on board, not just doctors, but patients also. Because uh, at the same beginning, we are giving all the adverse effects of the therapy, therapy that are based on clinical trials. Okay. But uh, every patient, uh, they, they have uh, their own, uh, own experience about the side effects, not physically, mentally also. Uh, what we did in our department is uh, raise that question and in collaboration with uh, some of organizations from USA, uh, we made a questionnaire started to make a questionnaire about the patients with breast cancer and about the uh, patients from prostate cancer because uh, they have different adverse effects uh, during the therapy. We tried to uh, make this questionnaire uh, adaptable for the patients. You know, uh, they, uh, it's a questionnaire when the patients are included of making questionnaire because it's, because it's not important only to give a questionnaire to the patient and patient doesn't understand the questionnaire. Mm -hmm. But the way the questions are asked on the way they can understand and then ca can give the right answer and about the graduation of the severity of their symptoms. They, uh, we are now including about 40 patients, uh, and this is only for the uh, Macedonian patients, for the institution in our country, in, uh, translated in our language and the language of our patients. So that, uh, we suppose that we, it will help us to overcome and to implement palliative care at the same beginning of the therapy, which uh, it is more important, the same important as same, as same as the therapy, because it can improve quality of life and uh, life beyond the disease. That's, uh, that's I want to point out that it's not important that we can publish the questionnaire, but most important is every institution to raise the question uh, about that, like we did, and uh, to make their own questionnaire for their patients. Thank you. Well, thank you. What is important, though, is that when you get results, you share them. And if you can share them internationally, uh, please do, because um, 
uh, the more it's data better. we have, mm -hmm. better. It's better. But I I want to say that uh, we uh, we can't wait uh, somebody to make the questionnaire and to give to the patients, but the patients also should be involved in that uh, making the questionnaire. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, when we collect enough data, we have the real questionnaire who can help the patients because yes. it's for them. Yes. Don't, don't forget the, the pathway that Dagmara showed of how EORTC develop uh, the questionnaire because um, there is a, a long experience there and a lot of uh, experience has gone into the, creating a rigorous process which ensures that the language is uh, right and that the um, understanding is properly shared. Uh, the question is properly understood. Um, but, uh, and, and, you know, do use the RTC library if you can. Remember it's free, free, free for academic use. So, um, uh, you know, contact Dagmara if you, if you want to know more about that, please. Um, are there any more questions in, in the room? No, we are done. <laughs> no. uh, Lee has got his hand up online. So Lee, over to you. Yeah, I, I was just going to respond to the surgeon um, comment. Um, and I can see where you're coming from because um, we advocate that when you have a questionnaire, you should, even if it's already pre-developed, you should test in your local population. Um, just like you said, to make sure that it's um, applicable to them. So, you know, even the artistic questionnaires, which are, you know, validated and all, it's still important that when groups um, or research groups or clinical teams use those questionnaires, that you still do a process of working with the patients to ensure that the language is um, appropriate for that particular population. Um, before using those questionnaires. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dagmar, have you anything to add to this? Because uh, you've got a lot of the experience which is relevant to developing questionnaires. Well, I think my, my general comment would be to, um, like, yeah, you, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There is a lot of there. There are lots of measures that have been developed very thoroughly and then used. And there is a lot of data on on the studies in which they have been used. And um, it is yeah, it, it it makes sense to start first with checking what's already there. And uh, a lot of those measures are available in lots of uh, different languages and. Um, yeah, that we know that they work and they, the patients were included in making them and, and so on. So um, yeah, I would, I would maybe not advocate that every institution has to make their own questionnaire. That's, that might be a loss of resource and time and effort and patient's time and clinician's times and so on. So just a, a thought. <laughs> fair, fair, fair comment, yeah. Um, are there any more questions in the room? No? No. No more questions online. Well, I've got one last question. Uh, I want to ask Olga. Um, we have the tolerance study developed by Professor van der Graaf, um, and she's going to be talking about it this afternoon in the so soft tissue sarcoma stream. But I think the important thing to note in this context is that the primary outcome measure uh, is PROs or RPROs in this. And I know you've been involved in the development of, of this study. So can you just tell us a little bit about this sarcoma study with a PRO primary outcome? Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, so it's a three arm randomized uh, controlled trial and it's focused indeed on elderly patients with advanced soft tissue sarcomas. Um, and we know from our previous work that elderly uh, sarcoma patients have a preference for quality of life compared to length of life. But what I said, well, quality of life is never an endpoint or at least never a primary endpoint. So uh, we net came up with those three arms, um, which are um, 
standard of care uh, for those uh, patients group, but we don't know which one is best for health related quality of life. We know something about the objective outcomes like survival, but not quality of life related. So we are going to compare the three treatments with each other and then health related quality of life um, with role functioning and physical functioning is the primary endpoint, but we do assess uh, all other quality of life aspects as secondary uh, outcomes um, but we net will tell all the details about it and uh, well the good thing here is is that patients are involved in the trial uh, design from the start onwards and also in deciding on the main outcomes um, and one thing I would also like to mention uh, on one of the previous questions because I see that Evelyn Roots is also here online we are working on a project right now where we are go going to examine uh, when patient reported outcomes, specifically health related quality of life, if it is uh, incorporated in clinical research and if it's incorporated, if it's also reported. And we expect that we will find that it is not optimal and we will use again those data to show how important it is and that everyone should stick to incorporating quality of life. So that's an other addition, but um, well, we net will tell more about the tolerance trial, but I'm very, very happy because it's uh, one of the first trials in the sarcoma field with health related quality of life as primary endpoint, which is a big success. And I, th I think, and good to mention is that the EOC quality of life group uh, pays most of the money for this uh, trial and it's in collaboration with the EOTC soft tissue and bone sarcoma group. So I'm very happy to have a very nice collaboration with the clinicians, researchers and patients uh, for this trial. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's a trial that's sort of very close to me because it's evolved out of discussions I started uh, about, uh, I think it's 11 years ago now or nine years ago, something like that. And, um, you know, when it, when it took the challenge on, um, I think, you know, we'll close a little early, uh, give everyone a little more time for their, for their lunch. We're actually close a little late. <laughs> Are we? Oh, I beg your pardon. What were we meant to close at? Uh, half an hour ago. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that okay. explains why. <laughs> beg your pardon. Um, right. Apologies. So just ask you to thank our, our speakers, uh, Dr. Lee Alec Busi from Birmingham, Dr. Dagmara Goodish from Belgium, uh, Dr. Olga Husson from Amsterdam, and Richard Stevens from Stevenage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs>